All right. Here's the recording of the demo. So first, we're going to talk about the single turn uh pattern. Now, I grabbed this from somewhere. Doesn't really matter, but it all looks like this from a Java perspective. Okay. So typically, the singleton would manage something. We don't care what it is. Some could be a counter, could be a variety of things. Um, but it manages something. And we want to make sure we only have one access, uh, one instance of it, as an example. So what I want to do is I want to have a static singleton. Okay. And we'll explain why. All right. So with a static variable of a class, every singleton object will have this static variable. Okay. And this is going to be the single instance. It's going to manage the single instance of my singleton object. Ta-da! And that's how we do it in Java. Other languages might have other mechanisms for doing exactly this, but this is the Java mechanism for doing it. Java uh, essentially ensures that every very every object has every object has a static. All static variables of an object are held by every version of the object, right? This means that the static singleton single instance, you see this single instance object, a uh, single instance variable, is not actually a member of any singleton class. It's a member of the actual class itself. Uh, so no singleton object. It's the class. Uh, this is a class variable as opposed to an object variable. Okay, so what we do is when we go private singleton, we have a singleton be private. So we have a private constructor. Nobody can call it but itself. And then, of course, we have a get instance. One of the things we need is to synchronize access to our singleton because we're going to make sure that if multiple people hold this variable, that we're not they're not overriding each other. Remember one of the caveats of uh, objects, um, object oriented use of the singleton is we need to make sure we're synchronizing access to make sure we're thread safe. So we just throw the synchronized keyword on this. This makes sure that only one thread has access to the get instant method at any given time. And then the basic simple dilemma here is if single instance is null, we go ahead and grab it. Otherwise, we just return the single instance rather than actually create a new one. Every time we're going to just keep return the old one. Pretty simple. So I have a test harness here to show you how this works. I'm going to create three instances, X, Y, and Z. I'm going to just get you your hash code, okay? Just to show you what that looks like. These should be X, Y, and Z, not thing, right? Uh, remember, a hash code is a very good representation of the uh, variables that are located within the object. So in this case, there are no variables except for the actual singleton instance. So it's kind of a meaningless thing. Um, but I did include it. Then we have a check for equality. If X equals Y and Y equals Z, system out dot print line. Note there's no equals for singleton. So since we know that there's no equals, we know that there's we're using the object equals. So it's looking at the actual uh, memory location and determining whether or not those are the same. So we're going to go ahead and print that out using our test harness. Uh, it takes forever. I'm sorry. Uh, but you can see the hash code uh, doesn't really print anything. They're all the same. And you go, why is that the same? Well, there are no local variables, not really. The only variable we have in the singleton object is the singleton itself and the string. As a result of that string, and it just creates a hash code, but you can see they're all the same. How are they all the same? They have, have to have all the same variables, right? But more importantly, their location, their memory location is actually the same. This is using the object equals, which actually refers to its memory location. Where in the heap are they referring to? And you can see they're all referring to the same location in the heap. Therefore, they are, in fact, the same object. Now, again, why would we do this? If we want to maintain access to a very specific um, you know, like a method or two, and we want to make sure that only one object has access to it, like we're maintaining resources. And if we have multiple resource controllers, that's not actually ensuring, you know, one group of people get in, right? Like a lock or like a counter or anything where we have multiple 
things that could be using it. And we want to make sure that we're uh, providing a consistent view. We want to make sure that we're using the exact same object. This would be the way to do that. It's a pretty simple mechanism, but there you go. Uh, the observer is a little less straightforward uh, and unfortunately more contrived. Um, but what we have here is uh, a number. Uh, I'm just going to use a number. And what I'm going to do is set up a couple of observers on it. Uh, it has a state object, a state field, and we're going to monitor that state. We're going to have, say, get state. And then we're going to add observers. Uh, we add observers. Um, we'll talk about what an observer is in a second. We have observers. We have a list of observers. And then we have a notify all observers for the list of observers. Go and update up them all. If you look at the observer class, all it has is a protected my number. What are we actually observing? And an update method. So when we go to get the state, we do nothing. But when we actually set the state, we actually identify all observers that we're setting the state. Okay. Obviously, you would do this for a much, much more complicated object. I just get made a very simple version of this. So I have a string observer, and the string observer just takes a number. Um, and the number, of course, adds an observer on it. And then the update just prints out the state. Not very exciting. Uh, binary observer does something slightly more interesting. Uh, it prints out the integer in a binary string. Not very exciting. Uh, but when you look at the test harness, we have our number, we have our observers, we set the observer to, to observe the numbers, and we change the state. By just by changing the state, it's going to trigger um, the observer to wake up and do something. This is very important. We're actually going to set them to do something upon each system change. So we have a system change here where we change the state to three. You can see the string observer uh, is three. And it just prints three. The binary observer is one, one, which of course is translates to three. Yay. Exciting, right? Not really. The next one we have five. Uh, and so five is one, zero, one for the binary observer and five for the string observer and so forth. The same is 10. Uh, the binary observer is one, zero, one, zero. And the string observer, of course, is one, zero. This is just setting up a way to set up a automatic observer class. Now, there was a time in the Java language that this was a high enough level thing, a thing you needed enough that they actually had a built-in observer class in the Java utilities um, that automatically have an update. However, due to the special nature of this uh, thing and the fact that we need to have access to the, um, and then we need to have access to the actual variable to see what the update is. It's more often done the way we just did. In other words, using our own classes and so forth. Not very exciting, I know. But that is more often the way it's actually done. Okay. Uh, the proxy is a little bit more complicated. Uh, here I have a server. This server I created uh, for an actual network programming class. It creates a server socket and then you know accepts the socket and creates a thread and starts the thread. Exciting, right? Uh, for the thread, it just wakes up. Pretty simple. Gets a date, formats a date. I have it print the date because I was worried that the date wasn't going to be, uh, wasn't going to look good. Uh, and then I have it format. And then I have it write it out, flush, and go, and quit. Okay? Uh, why did I do that? Pretty simple server. There's nothing really exciting about this server. It's just going to report um, it's simply just going to report the date and move on with life. Okay. So this is the actual test server. Okay. For that particular server. And what it does is it actually connects to the server. In this case, it writes out to the server and then reads from the server. Okay. So you have to know quite a bit about sockets. You have to create a socket. You have to do all these things. Well, I don't want to do that. So I created a client. But what this does is it takes a port or it doesn't take a port. And the get time method simply is going to create a socket. It's going to read from the socket. And it's going to close the socket. When it's done, it's going to return the time. Okay. And my test harness doesn't need to know anything about sockets. It grabs a client, 
String out is client dot client uh, client dot get time, and then it's going to print it out. So let's run it and see what happens. And you can see it prints out the date that it got from a server. Now this is a very contrived server that does very little. I get it, but the point of this isn't to show you how complicated uh, we can make the server. It's the point of this is to show pretty quickly and easily that you can simplify the details of say a network client or a network proxy to this level of detail. Now look at this server client here. It throws an exception. So if something goes wrong with this code, it just throws the exception to the test harness. If the test harness wants to do something about it, it can. Uh, one of the downsides of uh, simplifying things for clients is when we simplify things for clients, we might end up with situations in which um, there's no real way to undo it, if you, if you know what I mean. The client does not have access to what could have gone wrong or the means to do the differentiate it. So we have to just pass exceptions through here. Uh, in real terms, the client might handle some of these exceptions and throw their own types of exceptions as a means of, you know, simplifying the interface. But this is what a uh, proxy looks like, right? It handles and simplifies uh, the actual calls to be very simplistic, right? So client.get time, we and it returns a string. We don't have to worry about um, anything other than being able to understand how to use this method, which is super, super easy. Uh, okay. So there's our examples. Um, I'm going to make sure you have access to these so you can play with these all day long. Um, if you have any questions, please make sure to ask me. Um, Y'all have a great day. All right, thanks.